call to order the regular commission meeting for the city of Dickinson. Let the record show that all commissioners are present. First item this evening is the pledge. Thank you everyone for attending this evening. Our next item up is the order of business. Mr. Dossinger, are there any changes to the order of business? Uh, good evening, Mr. President, members of the commission. Uh, there is no change to the order of business. Thank you, Mr. Dossinger. Any questions on the order of business? Thought I'd look for a motion. Move to approve. A motion to approve. Second. And a second. All in favor of the order of business as presented, state aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item up is the consent agenda. Commissioners, are there any items on the consent agenda you wish to discuss? Hearing no discussion on the consent agenda, I'd look for a motion. Mr. President, I move to approve. A motion to approve by Commissioner Bear. Second. Second by Commissioner Frederick. Any further discussion or questions on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we'll vote. Dr. Bear? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mrs. Sobolak? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. We'll move into administration and finance. First item up, we have a uh, Dunn County Fair Association gaming site authorization at Fatfish, and this will be presented by City Administrator Dossinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We do have one gaming site authorization request uh, this evening. That is for, from the Dunn County Fair Association. It is for Fatfish Brewing, located at 1031 West Villard. Uh, the effective date of that would be July 1st of 2023 to June 30th of 2024. It would be for bingo, raffles, prize board, electronic pull tab devices, pull tab dispensing device, sports pools, 21, poker, and Calcutta's. Uh, city staff has reviewed the application and recommend approval. Thank you, Mr. Dossinger. Any questions on this gaming site authorization? Hearing none, I look for a motion. Move to approve. I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Frederick. Second. Second by Commissioner Sobolak. Any further discussion? I can't remember what we had determined last year. Um, had we determined that this was close enough to a Dickinson um, recipient of funds in order to, for it to qualify? They, they donate to two different local okay. um, groups, if I'm correct. Okay. Dickinson Wrestling and um, they're still working on, if you look at the Fishing for a Cure, they're still working on okay. that one to get that one. Okay. So. And any other questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Sobolak? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Dr. Bear? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Uh, Mr. Dossinger, you have a report? Um, yes. Uh, at a previous city commission meeting, uh, the job description for the deputy public works director position was presented and approved. Um, this evening, I am requesting to move forward in filling this position in an interim capacity with Solid Waste Manager Prouse. Uh, my intent is to have Mr. Prouse fill this position, uh, further evaluate how functionally efficient operating with two managers, a deputy director, and a director is for the future of the Public Works Department for approximately three to four months. I will then open this position up to internal and external candidates. Um, this is not a budgeted position for 2023, uh, but due to, the, to not filling the street and fleet manager position, and the number of vacancies in public works this year, it will not negatively impact the budget. Um, the reasoning behind this request is the strength and the work on the leadership path prior to public work director Zerhoff's uh, tentatively planned retirement next year. At this time, I'm requesting authorization to move forward in filling this position. Thank you, Mr. Dossinger. Any uh, questions from Mr. Dossinger on this position?
I guess I do have one question. And so you're requesting authorization from us just that it's an unbudgeted position from last year, and so we need to approve that before you can fill this? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. So I would move to approve that. Um, the city proceed with this position. I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Solak. Second. Second by Commissioner Oderman. And then the plans are for uh, Mr. Proust to still oversee solid waste in the interim, right? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Mrs. Sobolak? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Dr. Bear? Aye. Chair votes aye, motion carries. And then you have a report for us on the budget workshops. That's correct, just want to remind the commissioners that on June 28th, we do have a budget, uh, our first budget meeting scheduled with the commissioners uh, beginning at 1 to 5 p.m. Uh, here at City Hall. At that point in time, you'll be seeing uh, some of the requests made by department heads and recommendations from, uh, from me moving forward with those uh, requests. Thank you, Mr. Dossinger. Any questions for Mr. Dossinger on the budget workshop schedule? And for the public, that again, that is June 28th. Um, it'll be here at City Hall, 1 to 5. Next up is our monthly financial report, and this will be presented by Finance Supervisor Mori. Welcome. Thank you, President Decker and Commissioners. Starting off with our May 2023 uh, financial report, uh, the, the main item I want to show on our treasurer's report here, so no major changes on any of our amounts, except you can see on the very bottom, um, our interest rate as of May 4th, we were uh, notified that our interest rate went from 2.55% up to 2.8 on our cash accounts. So uh, we did see that incre increase in May. And then our invest investments um, did incre decrease, excuse me, about 2%. Uh, just based on distributions for our pensions um, and some of those items, um, we, we do make our contributions to those funds at the beginning of the year. And then starting with our revenue, uh, this first slide here is our 1% sales tax collections. Green is 2023, uh, blue is 2021, and then red is 22. So you can see we're a little higher compared to May of 2022, about 36,000 higher, but just a little less than May of 2021. Um, we are about 8.5% higher in May of 23 compared to May of 22. This next slide here is just for a reminder to the public to show that we have our sales tax collected in two separate funds. And then our total 1.5% sales tax comparison for the first, seven year, our first five months over the last seven years, uh, you can see our, our first five month total is, is uh, higher than it's been in each of the last um, seven year comparison. So we're actually about $765,000 higher for the first five months of 23 compared to 22, which is about a 20% increase there. And our hospitality tax, again, the green line is uh, 23. So you can see um, that collection is higher than both May of 21 and 22. We're about $26,000 higher than May of 22, which is about um, actually about a 50% increase um, just because of May of 22 being a lower collection. And then in our uh, five month totals, our seven year comparison for our hospitality tax, uh, the first five months um, were again the highest of the last seven years. So we're about 49,000 higher compared to the first five months of 2022. In our occupancy tax, again, the green line 23 is a little higher than each of the previous two years. We're about $19,000 higher compared to May of 22, so about a 20% increase there as well. And then in our five month totals, in the comparison for the last seven years, um, also happens to be the highest. Um, we're, we are um, about a 20% increase compared to um, the first five months of 22. And then in our oil impact, so um, the red line being 22, you can see that was the highest. So we are down compared to May of 22, down about $327,000, about a 20% decrease there. 
in our total comparison, um, we're the third highest that we've been um, in the last seven years at 6.3 million, down about 363,000 um, compared to the first five months of 22. So that's about a 5% decrease in our, in our oil impact revenue for the first five months. And then our budget versus actual update. Um, so for our benchmarks, we would expect to be at 41.67% through five months. Our revenue would just barely ahead of that at 43% collected. And then our general fund expenses, we are still under budget with 36% expended through five months. Um, and then we're still, as we mentioned before, a little behind in our utilities. Um, we'll expect to see that increase over the summer months. Um, but utility revenue collected is, is under our benchmark, benchmark of 41%, with 35% of our utility revenue collected. Um, and then our enterprise fund expenses are at 24%. So um, again, we'll see that uh, increase, increase quite a bit over the summer months. So um, with that, I'll do my best to answer any questions. And city staff recommends approval. Thank you, Mr. Mori. Any questions on the monthly financial report? Mr. President. Dr. Bear. Mr. Mori, just, just, for, just more for my own uh, understanding, the oil impact revenue, when you look at that slide, what would make it drop that low? You know, I, I, I'm not sure specifically, but that's something I could reach out to the state. Um, are you, and are you talking the month-to-month -month comparison? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something I could reach out to the state for because I know that specific time frame was significantly higher than normal. Um, so in our oil impact, we were in uh, May, of, May of 22, we were about 1.5 million, actually almost 1.6 million, 1,582,000. So it was just significantly higher than most of the collections receiving. So we happened to get 1.25 in May of 23. So it's it's higher than we've been in previous years. It just happened that 22 was so high um, that it's hard to it's hard to compare it to where we were at in 22. But but I can reach out to the state and see if they have exact figures on on showing that decrease. So is this going to impact us at all with budgeting or anything like that? So we actually um, are still ahead of where we forecasted. We forecasted. So the last two years we forecasted, uh, I believe, 13 million around. Um, in 2022, we just happened to collect 17 million, over 17 million. So we were significantly higher than where we thought we would be. Um, in forecast, and in 23, we forecasted 13.5 million. And if we take our monthly average, we're actually projected to be at 15.1 million. So we're still ahead of where we forecasted, just not as high as we were in 22. Okay. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, I look for a motion. Mr. President, I move to approve. A motion to approve by Commissioner Bear. Second. Second by Commissioner Soluk. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, we'll vote. Dr. Bear? Aye. Ms. Soluk? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Chair votes aye. <coughs> Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you got a uh, fee schedule too. Yes, thank you, uh, President Decker and Commissioners. So um, what we have before you tonight is the 2023 Dickinson Legacy Square uh, fee schedule. Um, we weren't able to get this in front of you, obviously, in December when the rest of our fee schedule was, was presented. So um, doing this now, going into our summer, month, summer months as the Legacy Square is opening up. Um, so included in your packet, I just have on our PowerPoint um, the, the amounts that we have right now. Um, the first section you can see is our, our rental fees, our per day slash per event amounts. Um, and then, then under the blue line, we have our additional options that are available per event. Um, we also have um, our amounts for deposits and cancellations, vendor fees, and then small event vendor fees. Um, so with that, if you have any questions, I know Mr. Walters is in the back. Um, and um, City staff does recommend approval. Thank you, Mr. Mori. Any questions on the fee schedule amendment for the Legacy Square? And this is resolution 12-2023. If there are no questions, I'd look for a motion. Mr. Dossinger, do we have any concerns that uh, $2,000 for the full venue will be 
will would deter people from utilizing the Legacy Square for an event? Uh, I believe you could ask Mr. Walters to come forward, but when we took a look at it. We did not want to start competing with some of our local vendors as far as the, uh, as far as weddings. We want to make sure that our price was high enough where we never we wouldn't com begin competing with them in a certain sense. Okay. And I know Mr. Walters. I did a quite a bit of research on other uh, ex external sites outside in other cities, and he can kind of come on comment on that as well. Sure. Good evening, Pre President Decker and Commissioners. We uh, looked at a number of different local venues, and um, then also did comparison with um, similar venues to this, whether those be you know um, outdoor venues like this within Wyoming, South Dakota, around North Dakota, just to kind of see what they what they might charge. Um, I think the the price that you see for the full venue rental it comes in under what you might um, see, for example, at the high end, if I can say that, uh, for uh, like the August house, their rental is, is significantly higher than this. Um, and then maybe we're just right around or maybe just a bit above, uh, for example, what um, the, some of the hotels that are event centers in town might be charging. So I think we're right on par with, with most of those uh, trying to come in without uh, overshooting or undershooting um, our estimate. And again, this is just kind of the, uh, the can I say the first draft of this, I'm trying to get this put in place. So in case people ask, and I have had inquiries already about rentals, um, and I've had to kind of put them off until we were able to finalize some of this, but just questions asked more than anything at this point about what that might look like, how much that might cost. So we can certainly adjust this if you feel that uh, that this is higher than it should be or lower than it should be. What kind, what kind of feedback did you get from people when you... Was there any sticker shock or? No, it did not seem to be at this point. And really, they were more um, involving like um, the smaller portions, uh, like the kids zone, what we're sort of anticipating might be a rental for like a birthday party or a smaller event. Um, I haven't had particular inquiries about the entire venue rental at this point. Oh, good. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Any other so questions? Those, mm -hmm. So those smaller rentals, the, the stage rental would be like, let's say we're going to bring over the preschool and do some little acts right. on stage right. or something. Those would be the type of things. The full venue rental would be like the entire space. The entire space mm -hmm. and nobody else is really allowed to come on there at that point right, in time. Right. It's not a public. At that point, it is no longer used as a public facility for the duration of that rental period. And that would also include then not only the space itself, but tables, chairs, and any of the, uh, the amenities that we would include. If you think about what a... You know, let's say you're going to uh, rent from one of the hotel um, event centers. That's just for usually just for the use of the space. So that does not include your sound system, your your TV screen, any of those kind of things. Well, it may in certain instances, but overall, you're going to be hiring externally for a lot of those other services. So we would be able then within that two thousand dollars to provide. Um, all of those things. Then we have the add-ons listed as well where um, maybe, and we really just tried to break this down to try, to try to anticipate what people might want to rent. I mean, is anybody gonna rent just the stage? Not likely, but if they did, here's a fee that's in place for that. Or just the concourse space, which we're kind of uh, calling that center area where there are no structures in, uh, in place. If they wanted to just use that, what that might cost. And then the add-ons would be the screen or the audio system, et cetera. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Mr. President, I got one. Commissioner Barrett. Mr. Walter, have you compared this to other outside venues like other cities across mm -hmm. North Dakota that has the same kind of space? Yeah, I would How, say. I would, where, where are we mm -hmm. with compared to the? those cities and their square. Right. Not all of them um, necessarily are going to rent out the entire venue, for one thing. Um, but then not all of them have the amenities that we do either, uh, which I'm happy to say. We have quite a few things that we're offering within this. So I can get you actual numbers if you'd like to see a little bit more of a direct comparison. Obviously, like I said earlier, I've had the phone conversations with venues all around this area trying to make those comparisons. So I feel we're coming in at a, at a fairly decent price here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd move to approve. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Oderman. Second. Second by Commissioner Frederick. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Sobolak? Aye. Dr. Bear? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries.
Our next item up this evening is we have a Chapter 16 Code Amendment, and this will be presented by HR Director Namanuk. Welcome. Thank you, President Decker and Commissioners. This first code amendment uh, is for the emergency call-out special scheduled time pay. Um, a while back, it was July of 2020, we came before you and asked for a, a policy change to allow for remote call-in for 15-minute increments for those staff members that are at home and have to respond maybe via computer to a, a, um, an alarm or something like that. And that code change was passed and approved. Then in January of 21, there were other changes made and approved. However, the master code had not been updated with those 2020 changes. So it reverted back to the code before the 2020 changes were made with the call out and special scheduled time pay being changed. So what we're asking for today is for these remote call-in changes to be reenacted. Civil service has been made aware of this amending and reenacting of, of 29.08.04070 of Article 29. And we're hoping that the changes with the Muni code um, software will alleviate this issue in the future. In Thank you, Mrs. Nominick. Any questions? And this would be Ordinance 1775. Mrs. Nominick, in 16.6, .6, it refers to skill based pay again. I thought that we don't even have that anymore, do we? We do not, and I, um, it has it is marked out, so we're taking that out of there. Well, it's red. That means it's a change. It's being taken out. That that means it's. Oh, it's not out. marked out on this on my copy. So, 16.6. .6, it's a shift differential pay and skill based pay. Commissioner Frederick, I don't know what exactly version is, but uh, Ms. Nominuk and I did have that conversation. The intent it is to be stricken. The city okay. no longer has it. So we will make sure that it is in the correct ordinance, but yes, it is to be stricken. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think the numbering may just need to be changed. So. Are there any other questions on Ordinance 1775? Not I'd look for a motion. Mr. President, I move to approve. Motion to approve by Commissioner Bear. Second. Second by Commissioner Oderman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Dr. Bear? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mrs. Sobolock? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Mrs. Nominick, I think you're still up, right? You got yes, HR? Yes, a couple more things. Yep. Thank you again. Uh, the next one is our sick leave bank. Um, what our intention in, is here is to make a change to our sick leave bank to allow for donated leave time for uh, employees to use that donated leave time for sick family members. Currently our policy does allow donated leave time for their own illness. So if, if I were sick and I didn't have any more leave time left, I could ask my coworkers to donate their leave time to me through the sick bank. But we don't have anything in place to allow me to ask my coworkers to donate leave time if my chi young child is sick or my husband is sick and I have no leave time left to use. So that is what we're asking here today is to allow employees to ask for donated leave of other family members to care for their own sick family members per the FMLA guidelines. This has been approved by civil service and city staff is recommending approval. Thank you, Mrs. Nominick. This will be ordinance 1776. Are there any questions? I would have a comment. Commissioner Oderman. Uh, you know, I saw the, the, the change from city administrator to human resources. I don't know how the city administrator was tasked with that originally in the first place. It's much more natural and understandable for human resources to oversee this process. Yeah, you'll so. probably see that coming forward a lot because at one point it designated the city administrator for a lot of those duties. So as we clean things up, it'll we'll be fixing that. That's a really good change. I think we had this discussion like six years ago <laughs> about needing to change this. Yeah, because, yes. 
So yeah. there was a lot of them that went to city administrator right. or designee. So right. then, but do we ever have a list of designees? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so that that was a good change that I saw. Yeah. So. I would move to approve. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Oderman. Second. Second by Commissioner Frederick. Any further discussion? Hearing none will vote. Mr. Oderman. Aye. Mr. Fr Frederick. Aye. Ms. Sobolak. Aye. Dr. Bear. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. And you have your monthly hiring report. Mrs. Nominick. Yes, thank you again, President Decker, Commissioners. Um, I don't want to jinx us, but it seems like um, in the last week or so, we've been um, getting applicants. So we're um, really excited about that. Um, we have made a hire for the librarian, the Marketing and Outreach Services Librarian. Uh, we had two openings for the limited hour library page, and we did fill one of those. We have an advanced computer technician position open, and we are getting um, applicants, which we're really excited about. Planner position, as you know, Matthew Gilbert was um, hired and has already started that position. Code enforcement officer, um, we did make an offer to an in, in a, a seasonal position for that, and we'll open up the um, code enforcement position in a bit here for full time. Building inspector two was an internal position and uh, Blaine Ducart was promoted to that position. Building inspector one, they actually did the interviews today and so they're in the interview stage for that position. Police officer, we have five openings. The position is currently open. Uh, the lateral police officer, we've been having some luck there with getting some um, experienced officers to apply. We did make an offer one is in background for the lateral police officer position. So we're super excited about that. We had a, have a patrol sergeant open internally. A communications specialist, we are in the interview stage for that position. Deputy police chief, we actually did those interviews today. It was internal only. Part-time firefighter, we have five openings there and we're in background stage for that position. Solid waste operator, we have three openings and uh, they're actually doing interviews tomorrow. Scale service rep, we are again have that position open, getting a good number, number of applicants. So we're really excited there. Street maintenance operator, we've had uh, six openings for some time open until filled. We did make two hires. Somebody started on Monday and one started today. So we are getting applicants there as well. We're excited about. Uh, the mechanic position we tried a few times at this time it's not currently open uh, the utility operator we had made two offers and two people have started so our actually one of them starts in july so we do not have any more open positions in, as utility operator the seasonal street laborer we did make one hire so we have three left we'll advertise that position until the end of june and then um, we'll just stop trying on that position. The seasonal utility labor, we have no openings left. All of those have been filled. The seasonal forestry labor, all have been filled. And then we currently have a building service worker for the museum open and taking applications for that. And I'll stand for any questions you might have. Thank you, Mrs. Nominick. Any questions on the monthly HR um, journal report? All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. It is five o'clock, so we'll go to the public hearing. First item up this evening on the public hearing um, will be a presentation by uh, Elder Care, and this will be presented by Director Colleen Rodakowski. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Colleen Radikowski. I'm the executive director over at Elder Care and Dickinson Public Transit. Um, it's wonderful to address um, Mayor Decker and the commissioners 
city employees and guests who are here today. Um, can I get my PowerPoint up? There you go, thank you. I'm presenting today our 2022 annual report and that's per the agreement that we have with the city. Um, with, um, first of all, I just have to thank you guys so much. Um, we can't be here, Elder Care and Dickinson Public Transit cannot be here without the support of the city. Um, we are, we're in a building that you, you guys own, the property and the building. Um, you um, house us, you pay our utilities, we get some funding from you, and we'll see that in some of the financials. And you pay the utilities for us as well, so that we can um, continue to provide the services. I'd like to introduce my team who's here with me. I have my assistant executive director, Aaron Humphrey, if you could stand. And then I have Rose Drake, our operations manager, with us as well. We have a wonderful team over at Elder Care and, and staff. I just want to share a mission with you. Dickinson Public Transit works to meet the changing, changing transit needs of Dickinson and the surrounding areas. We provide transit services to the general public that improves people's quality of life and freedom from mobility. This allows them the opportunity for employment, self-sufficiency, which may otherwise be impossible. In addition, elder care allows people, seniors, to remain independent in their home as long as possible because we provide the meal. We provide a senior meal to them um, through either congregate meal sites or through the home delivered meal that we deliver. This is, um, most of this I'm gonna start off with is on public transit and then I'll switch to elder care. Um, our successes in 2022 increased ridership, fully staffed with a fabulous team, purchased four new vehicles, um, we piloted a Christmas shopping shuttle, and we won Best of the Western Edge for the last five years. We're really excited about that. Um, and as well as updating social media more often to attract um, the community. Um, you might know, some of you that have seen me in the past, that this is a brand new PowerPoint that we created. I mean, I want to give the kudos to Rose. Rose was instrumental in creating it, and Aaron and the team at the office, we also fine-tuned it a bit. So we, we're excited to present a new look this year. I want to share with you the top five um, transits. We've got, we've, we've got work, medical, shopping, social, social recreation, and education for the, for the people. The top four trips are right here. Um, work is number one. That's been really since the oil boom days. Um, it used to be medical, but we're pretty excited how many people we take to work. Then we've got medical shopping. Public building is your city hall and other buildings in the town. That has been in the fourth group for probably four years or so. I add, we added the last four groups on the bottom with social, kidney dialysis, education, and miscellaneous. We provided almost 35,000 passenger trips last year. This is just a little bit about classifications. Um, the first one is the general public, and then seniors, elderly would be that second bar graph. Um, wheelchairs, we provide about 2,500 of them a year. Kidney dialysis and then trips to Bismarck. We do go to Bismarck on Tuesdays of every week. And you can go other days as well, um, pending a driver and vehicle availability. Next, I'd like to give you a a little testimony from one of our writers. This is Michael Cook. I've um, been very grateful to utilize the Dickinson Public Transportation Services. I was looking for a job and especially during the winter months here in February, um, you guys were able to get me to job interviews on time and um, I was prepared and not having to walk in negative degree temperatures or a hundred inches of snow because we did have a record um, winter of snowfall and um, I was able to secure a job by utilizing public transportation services to getting me around town to the interviews and you guys have been able to get me to work every day and you pick me up and you take me home. The drivers are always courteous, dispatch is always very gracious to work with and it's been extremely helpful to have this service as I have been attempting to um, go to school full-time and work part-time in the community. Dickinson Public Transportation has been very helpful in making that possible for me. 
Next, I want to just talk about a little bit the critical needs that we have to sustain public transit. We need to maintain and increase funding. We had a tough year in 22, and you're going to see that. We had a loss of about 121,000 with both programs. First time in my career, 15 years. But, but it was hard. It was a hard year after COVID and with the increase in inflation. Partnerships are, are vital. Like I said at the beginning, the City of Dickinson partnership, our partnership with DOT, um, the state, we also are partnered with the Senior County Mill Levy, United Way, Adult and Aging Services with the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we, very important that we continue to retain staff and adapt to new market needs. And here's our agency income for 2022. We pulled in about 2.6 million. Brent of our, the brunt of the dollars that come in are agency income, and that's from the, the support we get from DOT and aging with the state. The local match includes the gifts, uh, the funding that we receive from the city is right there. That 150,000 where half goes to transit, half goes to meals. Um, the city transit subsidy of 55,000 is all in the local match category. Our, our expenses for 2022, almost, almost 2.8 million. You see the loss of 121,000. Um, and I'm gonna explain that in the next slide. The net income. There was $60,000 we didn't get, get reimbursed from the state. They made some changes to the pots of dollars that were av available to us. So we lost about 60,000 there. More than usual capital products and vehicle repairs. Our vehicle fleet last year I shared is really aging, but we've been bringing in new vehicles. We're selling some vehicles right now on um, govdeals.com. So if anybody in the community of Dickinson or here would like to, to put a bid in on any of our vehicles, we're on govdeals.com right now with I think five vehicles and we've got four more coming. Four right now? Five, five. So we have more than usual capital. Less local match that we received. You guys, increase of raw foods and all costs have really affected elder care. Um, we served 9,000 more meals last year than the year before. That's significant. That's the highest increase I've, I've seen. And that some of that was through COVID. When COVID hit, we were feeding more seniors who were homebound. We were receiving extra CARES Act dollars through um, the state and as well as our county has given us some of those dollars now that those dollars are slowing down We're going back to how we were operating But we've been giving more meals out and people aren't able to donate like they used to to elder care We asked for a five dollar donation a meal I even see the people who maybe can donate are not are not donating because of the fear of inflation Everything is so high. I do want to tell you that we're slated for this year to be 14,000 more meals than last year so our meal program has really been going up in, in Southwest North Dakota. Challenges we're facing right now is, is the funding, replacement of buses, cost of our operations, hiring and retaining our staff, traffic congestion, sometimes those deteriorating road, road conditions as well. I do wanna say funding, I wanna thank the city as well for the city sales tax funding. I put in for a rebuilt dishwasher in Hedinger was given the money. Um, Hobart gave, gave us a, a significant, wonderful um, deal on the dishwasher from my quote, and I'm so grateful that those dollars, those extra dollars we got from the city sales tax is gonna help us with milk and food trays, home delivered trays um, in our raw foods and um, supply category. Last year, excited, Brian Kopp. I bet many of you people here know Brian. He's our IT guy. We nominated him as friend of transit. Aaron and Rose went to the DTA conference that was held and they presented, he was presented, Brian Kopp, at the friend of transit for the state of North Dakota. This is a little small slide, but these are our goals for 2023 this year is we want to create, always working to create that financial stability. Um, we want to operate in a shopping shuttle services. Um, we're actually going to be doing that with Rough Rider Days coming up. We're going to be taking, um, we're working with a parking, parking place in town. I'm sorry, Rose, where's that at? Herberger's parking lot in the behind. We're gonna be taking busloads of people down for the concert. And that's gonna help alleviate some of the traffic and the parking down there. We've been wanting to do that for a long time, so that's gonna be a great addition. Continue to work with our so social media, um, perform boulevard repairs, continue to, um, and that's the po boulevard at our building. We've got a grant that we received, and um, Aaron Prouse is helping us as well to, re to fix the, the boulevard. 
and continue to provide safe rides, update our bus fleet, and retain and hire our qualified staff. Here's our fleet. You can see some of the high miles on some of them, that, and we've got a few more, two more buses that we are going to be purchasing here soon, and we are bringing a bus down from Minot that's getting transferred to us next week. Here's a little bit about elder care. You know, we're, we opened all of our meal sites in the fall. We were probably the last one in the state to open our meal sites with COVID, but that also has increased our meals. We were able to hire and maintain our staff. Um, the office staff is a fabulous team. Um, we have a great capacity of a team that we haven't seen for a while. And we're able to fundraise to cover some of the shortages. And here's a meal program testimony. We've got two short ones to share with you. It's jumping to the second one. I'm not sure why. If I didn't have these meals, <clears throat> I probably wouldn't eat a meal at all during the day. I would just snack here and there. And it gets me out of my apartment. I don't have to cook it. And it has everything I need. And being with others eating rather, with someone rather than alone is a big plus. The first one is just not working. I'm going to try one more time, but I think I don't. <clears throat> go back one more. We're just not working that one. Uh, well, I can't cook because I'm disabled. If I stand 10 minutes, then I get a muscle spasm, and then I lose my balance. So I can't cook. And. Um, and uh, so these, these meals are very important to me. Okay. If I did. Okay, elder care meals, they increased, like I said, 9,000. We provide 73,500 meals in last year. Our challenges is increase in seniors needing the meals. We're running out of state reimbursements. We are out the last two months of money, so we'll be short about 80,000. Um, this in June right here because the we've already secured the pot of dollars the state has given us So then when we still have to continue to serve senior meals, we just don't get reimbursed anymore um, Rising costs and inflation. We've talked about the need to provide marketable wages and benefits um, we always are looking to provide a really good benefit package for our staff um, partic Participants can't afford to give a donation and we did have the loss we have had a loss on and off in the meal program and maintaining and hiring our staff. Our goals is again here, financial security. We'd like to p create a takeout meal because a lot of seniors, 60 and over, who qualify for our meals are working still. And sometimes they're living alone and it's nice to be able to, take, to have a takeout meal and open more Cafe 60 sites in town. So in conclusion, yeah, big thank you to all of you for your service, um, for your support of elder care and our seniors in our community and the Dickinson Transit Services, people rely, those testimonies were so wonderful to hear. Um, people rely on us. Um, big thanks to our contract entities, DOT and Aging, the Elder Care Management Board, my team that's here with me today, and all the staff who's not here. I always have to give kudos to the staff and team at Elder Care and Public Transit because we're able to do what we're doing because of all the partnerships and all of us together, and then of course the community as well. So. And I can entertain any questions you have. All right, thank you, Colleen. Uh, any questions, commissioners, for Ms. Rodakowski on uh, public transit or elder care? You guys do a, a wonderful job, and we really appreciate all thank the hard you. work you do. Thank I you know so much. we're all challenged right now, but you guys are pushing through, so I appreciate it. Thank so. you. And how we're handling that deficit, what I'm doing is we're fundraising. We're, it's something I haven't had to do over the years as much, but looking at gaming funds, fundraising, Power of 100 Women, I'm just getting out through the team and us. We're just getting out more to bring in more dollars. So thank you. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks. Our next up. Um, item up this evening, we have a public hearing on the Sundance Cove's Lighting Special Improvement District, and this will be presented by our Engineering and Community Development Director, Skolzicek. Good evening, Mr. President, Commissioners. 
Uh, the Sundance Lighting Cove Special Improvement District, uh, number 202301-1. If you remember, this was actually uh, previously approved at the April 4th, 2023 City Commission meeting, and uh, so we've now gone through the uh, public protest period. We only had 15 total protests out of 189 uh, overall properties within the, the Special Improvement District. Overall, that's 7.9% uh, of uh, of the individual property owners protesting. And um, so with that being said, city engineering staff recommends approval. Thank you, Mr. Skolczyk. Um Any questions on the Sundance lighting uh, special improvement before we go to the public hearing? Do we have to approve it again? We already approved it. Oh, we have to have this public hearing. So. Okay. Yeah, because we have to go through the protest. Sure. What's the threshold for the protest again? 51 percent. 51. 51. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we were we were well outside of it. I, okay. I can't remember the exact number. You're, you're probably right. I'm sure. Fresh. Any other questions or comments? If not, I will open up the public hearing. If anyone wishes to come forward, has any comments on the Sundance? Um, Cove's Lighting Special Improvement District, please come forward, state your name, and let the City Commission know your concerns. If you're watching online, 701-456-7006. And for the general public, up on the screens is the area that is in that district. Anyone wish to come forward and have any comments on the Sundance Cove's Lighting Special Improvement District? Does anyone have any comments? Seeing no one has any comments on the Sundance Cove's Lighting Special Improvement District, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioners, do you have any further questions or comments? The only, I, I just have a, a, I guess a question. Um, how soon will this project begin? Yeah, so we're doing a design review uh, shortly here. I, I, I'm not sure if it's scheduled, like, it might be next week. And then, uh, uh, but ultimately we're gonna try to get this out to bid as soon as possible. Okay, now that so they're probably, the likelihood it may, may may not happen this year depending on availability of a contractor availability of the contractor and materials so right there's definitely a reasonable probability that um, you know for instance the polls uh, and overall terminations into the polls will probably take place next year that's reasonably likely okay are there any other questions comments If not, I would look for a motion. So I have a technical question on that. We have this underneath our public hearing, plus we have Sundance Cove Lighting under our community development. Are they one in the same, or is there something different that we'll be approving? Uh, I don't think there's anything different. Okay, so it just, the, the slides are attached under community development, but we're talking about this under here okay right y yes miss uh, commissioner so look I, I think it's a little confusing on on the agenda but uh it would be the um i believe the resolution for the special improvement yeah. district it's resolution 13 20 dash correct i mean 13 dash 2023 so okay. yes with this with the new muni code i think we're still sure, trying to figure out where that. everything's getting slotted okay. here well i'd move to approve okay so we have a motion to approve by commissioner Sobolok. second Second by Commissioner Baer. Any further questions or comments on Resolution 13-2023? Hearing none will vote. Mrs. Sobolak? Aye. Dr. Baer? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. And then the, the last um, in the public hearing and public comments, if anyone from the public wishes to come forward, this is your time. Any public comments on items not on the agenda 
or items um, on the agenda that were not listed in the public hearing. Jeff Fitzik, Dickinson City resident. Um, at Southwest Patriots, our next meeting July 11th, um, I often tell people to not only criticize uh, um, your elected officials, but also tell them when they're doing a good job. So in the spirit of that, um, on Mother's Day this, this uh, um, spring, my son was struck in, uh, on his bicycle by a vehicle at the intersection of Villard and Sims and sustained major injuries. I would like to publicly, on behalf of both my son, Mark Fitzek, and my wife, Ruth Healy, and myself, thank and commend the Dickinson Police Department, uh, specifically Officer Danica and uh, Lieutenant Hanel, for their uh, quick response and, and handling of this situation, and also all the Dickinson firefighters and EMTs and, and so forth that responded. Um, our experience with the emergency services in every parent's worst nightmare in the city of Dickinson was nothing but good. And we'd like to publicly thank everybody involved in that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Fistick. I wish uh, that it would be under better circumstances than that you'd have to come up and, you know, um, you know, praise the staff, but I, I'm hoping you know everything is is going okay and he's he's healing just fine now it was touch and go for a little bit but we we also would like to thank the community and we've done that already but it can't be done enough the prayers and thoughts from everybody really made a horrible situation turn out as best as possible so thank you guys thank you thank you mr Fitzgerald. anyone else from the public that wishes to come forward If you're watching online, you may call in at 701-456-7006. Again, if you have any comments on items not on the agenda, please come forward. Seeing no one has any public comments or concerns, we'll close the public hearing. We will move back into the normal agenda and the first item up will be public works and this will be our chapter 9 code amendment and this will be well it's it presented by it says solid waste recycling manager prowse but now i guess he's deputy city public works director as of about a half hour ago so get thank used you to the title for a short time so. thank you commissioner or president and commissioners uh a group of uh, us have met uh, this past week, um, consisting of Nick Stevenson, Jim Ladbury, Jeff Fitzek, uh, Commissioners uh, Dr. Bear, Commissioner Frederick, Attorney Wanko, uh, Director Zuroff, uh, Supervisor Lee Scable, and myself. And we have went through these codes um, after our last commission meeting. So. The changes that are in front of you are recommendations from the committee that had met. So to start things out, the first section is just um, section 9.01 is just definitions. It was added in multiple definitions throughout. Uh, the codes got pushed into one area. On 9.060, um, we are not allowing any live plantings to be put into our cemeteries. Um, floral displays must be secured to the Monument Foundation. At the mausoleum, floral arrangements are to be attached only to the covers by the vases that are purchased from the city. And there is an allowance for one three by five porcelain picture and also a military emblem if they were serving the country. If it's a uh, double occupancy niche or crypt, we are allowing two pictures, two emblems, and uh, one, one vase, obviously. All maintenance will be performed by city or authorized personnel. You will see that throughout the document in various areas. However, in one area where monuments and markers need to be moved, uh, we, Attorney Wanko and myself will draft up some language 
uh, in regards to authorizing our grave diggers to be authorized to move those monuments as deemed necessary so they can perform their services. 9.070, all monuments must be marked by city personnel for proper alignment. The foundations are part of the actual granite monument and they must have a minimum of four inches, or must be a minimum of four inches in depth and cannot be placed without the city's authorization. No monuments will be allowed to be put, placed between the designated area of the headstone or the footstone. And after August 1st of 2023, any privately owned benches that privately owned benches are prohibited. Existing benches may be removed if they are encroaching on adjacent property, which we have ran into in several areas. Section 909 was removed as we no longer utilize the vault building for storing remains. And section 9110, uh, all burials in the cemeteries must be placed in the vaults, liners, or a non, made of a non-biodegradable material. Changes to section 9.120, all funeral services will be scheduled by a funeral director who will then make arrangements with the city Temporary markers must be placed on the gravesite at the day of interment. There will be no more than two cremations allowed per single grave plot, and we will allow one urn with a casket and double depth caskets for an infant or a child burial only. We do have high water tables in the Dickinson South Cemetery, uh, therefore double deep burials are not allowed. However, we will continue to allow double depth burials in the uh, four existing cemeteries. Section 9.160 uh, was removed as the city does not provide any funeral services. Section 9.170, couple edits that were made there. Vehicular traffic and bicycle riding are not permitted off paved surfaces. Pets are allowed as long as they are, re as long as they are leashed and the owner is responsible for properly disposing of any waste. Unauthorized trucks exceeding 10,000 pounds cannot enter the grounds unless given special permission by the city. And water is provided at the cemeteries. However, cannot be left unattended and, must be prop and the hoses must be properly stowed uh, upon completion of watering. We have ran into some areas where sprinklers have been left on for extended periods of time and we want to eliminate that. So there will be some posts and hose reels placed um, in strategic areas. Section 9.200, um, those grave cemeteries at Dickinson South Cemetery will be sold in sections starting from west working east. A section is basically the parcel that was already plotted out, includes 684 spaces. Um, as we develop extra sections working east, we'll open those up for uh, sale as we deem necessary when those other spots are filled up. Section 9. Oops, section 9.210 is a new section that was added. Um, this is any documentation throughout our current code or our existing code that pertain to the fee schedule was brought into this section. Section 9.220, it changed the terms of years of, uh, the term in years from 80 to 60 for any unused or abandoned burial spaces if an owner or relative cannot be located. The city will do all their due diligence to locate those owners. Um, however, if it's not possible, we would then revert that money back to the, or we revert that plot back to the city and resell it. Section 9.30 talks about endangered grave sites. Any graves that we feel are in imminent danger or destruction by natural elements may be moved by the city with proper notification to that family member, to the family members. I know I went through those very quick. I will entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Prowse. Any questions for Mr. Prowse on the chapter nine changes to our um, cemetery management? <clears throat> Seems like everyone on board from all the meetings and everything, so okay. And um, how soon will you have that drafted material for the 
the monument by next meeting or at least but july that july 18th meeting the the language for the for the authorized personnel yeah authorized personnel yeah. Mr. President, what I envision us doing there is having a, a separate written authorization that uh, the city would um, basically sign with each independent uh, uh, grave digger. Uh, that way we know who's in our cemeteries. Uh, we are well aware of, of their capabilities and that okay. we have that consistent communication. So there would be no additional changes to the code. That would be a separate written document that we would work with, making sure, like I said, that the most important thing, we, we want to know who's working in our cemeteries. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Move to approve ordinance number 1776. Second. Um, I think this might 1777, oh, right? That's, a, that's what's on the document here, so. No. M Mr. President, I guess we'd have to go back and double check. When this got tabled, did a, an ordinance number get assigned to it? Yeah, it has to be 77. Yeah, because we, we just, we just we did, did a 76, did a 76 so. so, yes. So. Ordinance number 1777. So ordinance 1777. I still second it. I was really excited. <laughs> 1776. You must have been daydreaming during 1776 <laughs> before. So. And you made that motion to yeah. approve that one. So you just wanted to double up yeah. on 1776. Yeah. So. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Odeman? Aye. Ms. Solak? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Dr. Bear? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Let's see. Mr. Prowse, you have a um, bid opening, right? Nope. We have a cemetery. Oh, that's what uh, it mausoleum is. Mausoleum fee schedule. Yep, the fee schedule is next. Yep. Following the uh, Code 9 review with the committee, I did ask him for recommendations on the fee schedule. And uh, the following is what we had uh, agreed upon. Currently, St. Joseph, St. Wenceslas, and St. Patrick's Cemetery, the fees for those plots will remain the same, $500 for a city resident. A city resident is anyone living within city limits, and $600 for non-city residents. Infant grave sites are, is no charge for, and uh, we need that removed out of our fee schedule. So there are no changes that would be recommended to the existing cemetery. For the new Dickinson South Cemetery, which consists of, again, 684 plots, the committee recommendation was $900 for city residents, $1,000 for non-city residents. Using the $900 city resident uh, scale, it would bring in a revenue of $615,600. The actual project cost to put asphalt surface into that cemetery is $406,378. This does not include any land value, lighting, signage, irrigation, or fencing for that property, including maintenance as it starts filling up. Any questions before I move into the mausoleum? Okay. So I do have a question on that. Um, as we're continuing forward and we have to do all these, these um, other things, the lighting, the signage, the irrigation, the fencing, is that something that we could look at is editing these prices as part of like the annual fee schedule we'll be looking at this or is this a lifetime setting of this fee schedule? This actually would get reviewed annually as part of the fee okay. schedule. Cool. Thank yes. you. Moving into the new mausoleum, we have 160 Crip spaces available in the mausoleum, 368 niche spaces, uh, and then an additional 192 spaces, uh, niche spaces available in the columbariums. Utilizing the current pricing of what our existing mausoleum is, those prices are set from when the uh, first mausoleum was built, uh, it, we'd have a, a revenue of 706000 the committee recommendation, we'll increase that revenue to 2 million or 2 million 28,000. And the, the current project uh, summary is costing 1.45 million as we sit right now. There is a lot of maintenance that takes place at the mausoleums. Uh, there's obviously electricity uh, from the lights and the heaters that run on the interior. 
there's irrigation up there and there's a lot more uh, maintenance that's required, including washing the monuments down on a yearly basis that uh, we start it, we'll start doing from here moving forward. How does that $2 million break down? The estimated casket burial at a cemetery is $5,384, and the estimated urn burial at a cemetery is $3,624. The interior crypts, which are the high, most high demand, are gonna be the higher priced ones. They're gonna range for a single crypt, they're gonna range from $5,675 to $6,925, and the exterior crypts will range from $3,675 to $4,925. The niches on the interior will range from $1,375 to $1,675, and the exterior niche prices will range from $875 to $1,175. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Prowse. Any questions for Mr. Prowse on the cemetery fees and the mausoleum fees? If there are no questions or comments, I'd look for a motion. Mr. President, I move to approve. Motion to approve by Commissioner Baer. Second. Second by Commissioner Frederick. Any further questions or comments? Just happy we got this through tonight. Me and Dr. Bear spent three hours with the <laughs> committee the other day on this, so. I heard I there was arm wrestling. Your time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The donuts were good. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you filled up on them. I learned more about cemeteries and crypts than I ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve. So if there are no further comments or questions, we'll go ahead and vote. Dr. Bear? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mrs. Sobolak? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Now you have a bid opening. Real. Yes, we opened a bid on June 12th for a waste handler wheel loader for our, our landfill. Uh, three bids were accepted, two from Titan Machinery, one from Butler Machinery. Uh, the staff recommendation is to proceed with the purchase of an 962 cat loader from Butler Machinery for a total cost after trade of $312,750. All the units had a slight variation to, or an exceptions to the bid. However, on Titan Machineries, the largest was they, we had to add an additional warranty, which ranged from 90 to about $110,000 above their actual purchase price. So after I added that in, uh, Caterpillar definitely, or Butler Machinery definitely came in lower. Uh, this will be replacing a 950K uh, that is currently used at our landfill, and it is a 2023 uh, budgeted purchase item, purchase of a $350,000 over a five-year lease. Thank you, Mr. Prowse. Any questions on this, this bid from Butler? Move to approve. All right. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Oderman. Second. Second by Commissioner Sobolak. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Oderman. Aye. Ms. Sobolak. Aye. Mr. Frederick. Aye. Dr. Bear. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next up, we have a monthly report by Public Works Director Zeroff. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. Good President evening. Decker and Commissioners. Go through our public works report quickly, and if there's any questions, please um, ask me, and uh, we can talk about it and discuss it. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank Brianna Schmaltz, my or our admin assistant, for putting these together. She's been a lot more creative. Trying to keep up with police and fire is difficult, but she spent uh, some good time with this. Uh, in this time here, it's really difficult to get all the information together. Everybody's busy, and she works tirelessly to put these together and get them to read on time, so I want to thank her for her work on this. Uh, again, our services um, at our public works. Uh, since we've been talking about crypts, niches, and everything, I, I probably do the, the final 
uh, update on, on this project, the mausoleum. Uh, if you get out there, it's, they've finished the concrete, the parking lot, the curbing. They're putting in some light poles, and, and then they'll be putting in the flag poles and then the landscaping. So we're within a couple weeks of finalizing that project. Um, get a chance to get out there. Uh, the uh, newer mausoleum mirrors the big first one, and I think uh, the architect did a great job, and uh, they both looked to me like they were both done at the same time, although they were 27 years apart. Uh, the interior, they still have some flooring left to do, and uh, again, there's a little bit of landscaping left to do out there. Uh, some special events. Uh, the week of, or the month of May, uh, we had our uh, National or Public Works Week. We celebrated uh, and did uh, appreciation activities throughout the week. Um, I was not part of the committee, but the committee put together root beer floats, ice cream social, bingo, and dunk tank, a, a dunk tank that we all were involved with. Uh, there was a picture of uh, Mr. Prouse there getting ready to be dunked. Um, so uh, I think all the employees really appreciated uh, some time off from work, and uh, I guess we played bingo and did some other things, so it was a good event to, uh, for the Public Works staff. Um, uh, continuation of, of the American Public Works Week and celebrations, we're doing a uh, Public Works Family Day, uh, June 29th, um, at Legacy Square from 4 to 8 p.m. Um, we'll have hot dogs, chips, uh, drink, ice cream vendors, bouncy houses, equipment, hard hats and vests for kids. Um, please join us at the new Legacy Square. Uh, of course, it, it was discussed, which also has the splash pad and the dino dig. So I think that'll be exciting for kids. Uh, some of this, a lot of this was uh, put together, and we ha received assistance from North Dakota APWA, um, some other vendors, and so we're going to uh, thank the vendors and hopefully have a scroll on the TV out there too for it. So we're excited about this event. I see that it says for kids of all ages, so I hope you have an extra large helmet and a 2XL the, vest. The, so. No, we, we, we don't, but I, for, for you, Mayor, we'll get one. <laughs> all right. And other, any commissioners that want a hard hat and a vest, we, we'll supply that. Um, we actually have little stickers that uh, uh, lo uh, uh, the downtown uh, quality quick print provided, it said City of Dickinson on the, the new logo on the, on the little plastic helmets. So uh, again, the community helped supply things and I think it'll be fun. Uh, service request by the month. Uh, this is in our Opworks. Um, we had 146 in May. Uh, again, this does not include our preventive maintenance as our preventive maintenance, fleet or utility billing service requests. Pretty consistent. Um, Overview of the service requests. Majority were the garbage service can replacement, uh, followed by water, sewer, stormwater. Uh, you'll see some of this coming up for probably forestry and some things. You can see that in, uh, increasing. It, it, most of these requests are just from citizens that uh, go through our opworks. Uh, buildings and grounds employees um, worked on mowing and weed eating, uh, and. Um, Rights away, right of ways, boulevards and city properties, noxious weeds, vector control in the Legacy Square. Uh, May is a very busy month for all seasonals. Uh, and at the end, I'll sh uh, show you the new employees. We had uh, 12 new seasonals in Billings Grounds and three new seasonals in Forestry. And so May is putting all that together and, and starting to get caught up on all, all the things that need to be done out there. Um, and. Uh, get going, uh, keeping up with all the, the, the weeds and grass and trees. Fleet work orders. Um, 96 for May, uh, uh, picked up a little bit. We had uh, uh, some vacations in April, which being short staffed, it really lowers our fleet work orders. We did hire a new fleet service tech that helped us uh, 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 finish more of the fleet work orders, and hopefully that uh, will increase uh, in the next month. Kind of see how it's spread out with fleet uh, work orders throughout the, the city. Fuel, 
I don't know if this is important, but it, I think it does show how many gallons we use of fuel. Um, but if you don't think it's pertinent, we can sure put another slide in there. 11,576 gallons in May. Solid waste tonnage, uh, that did quite a spike in May. Um, I have some notes here. Um, I think because we had a, a really warm May, um, uh, just for some comparisons, uh, uh, grass was uh, 20, 222 tons, and normally it's 13 tons, or it was compared to 13 tons in April. Uh, dirt in it was increased a lot. Concrete was 452 versus 95 in April. Construction, uh, 1,750 tons compared to 759. Um, and May was cleanup week, so that's what you get in May, and the overall tonnage is coming in to the... Uh, Baylor building in the landfill. Mr. Zeroff, that's, yeah. that's still significantly more than like even last year though. Like what's the... It, it is. Um, you know, uh, I think there was a lot of the projects started at the same time. The weather was good. We had some asphalt, uh, uh, some crush come in, construction material, asphalt. I don't know what it is. It is considerably. I think it was just a warm month and everybody put together plus our cleanup week unless Mr. Prowse has some additional. Millings was a big thing of that, so a lot of the millings came in. Um, 1,526 in May compared to 265 in April. So. Uh, 4,615 scale tickets in May. Um, also, uh, quite a few gallons of stormwater, and then uh, now we'll uh, start tracking with our new leachate uh, lift station track, the uh, leachate pump to the water reclamation facility, and we'll start doing a graph and comparisons on that as that is starting to work through our, our system. Um, another uh, outreach program is uh, a great program through our recycle coordinator. It's called the Backyard Buckets Program. Uh, uh, they did a workshop on pollinators and native plants to put in gardens. I believe they have another uh, workshop uh, this, this month, I believe. Another one, the North Dakota Envirothon was in May. Uh, Rachel Schumacher, our recycling coordinator, uh, showcased, did uh, attended that and showcased what the city does and students learn about future environmental degrees and um, so I, uh, that was good outreach for, for her and the city of Dickinson. Utility building work, work orders. Um, about in the middle of uh, the last couple of years, uh, most of them were delinquent waters off 16 and, and then back on at 14. Um, we had a uh, couple register upgrades and some miscellaneous um, on that. Uh, we're continuing our uh, MIU program, most of it's for commercial right now, um, but uh, some of those are included in this also. Southwest Water Authority, we, uh, you can see in May, oh, it started to get warm. That's the millions of gallons we purchased from Southwest, 79.3. Um, kind of tell by that graph, it's gonna increase dramatically and, and um, uh, Mr. Mori uh, also talked about revenue. This next couple of months will be our, our revenue for the water distribution and uh, actually our utilities uh, for the year comes in these next months. A picture of uh, some uh, Operations in the uh, last uh, couple weekends ago on Fairway, uh, we had a sinkhole, um, and it was a uh, utility company bored through the stormwater pipe, and I don't know how long ago, but eventually it shattered it, and, and then you get the settlement, so things like that pop up. It was taken care of that Friday or early Saturday morning, um, and uh, so some pictures that were sent in. Effluent sold, uh, only a million gallons. That's one thing I want, we wanted to show is normally we, we sell about five to seven million gallons a month. Um, the Marathon Refinery was down for most of May, so you can really see the effect of amount of gallons uh, when that's off. Um, 
and uh, seven, 71 million gallons to the Heart River and four million gallons to storage. Started applying uh, the biosolids. I think they just did 10 hours. That'll increase considerably. We'll be doing that daily from now throughout the summer to uh, try to empty the biosolids tanks. So we'll be pulling the, the tank all summer long trying to inject the biosolids. Call out an overtime. Uh, total hours in May was 496 hours. See it broke down. Most of it was solid waste some water utilities, some street. Uh, street will be having less now and you'll see it in solid waste and utilities and probably some in buildings and grounds. Um, this is over and above um, solid waste and water reclamation are, are seven days a week. The others uh, coverage are five days a week, but then this is call out and overtime hours for me. Open positions, uh, Ms. Nominick, uh, Talk a little bit about that. We still have open positions. Um, I want to keep putting that out there that uh, please apply. Well, uh, like she said, we had a couple uh, new utility or street operators start this week, and um, I'm excited to see some um, people applying and starting to fill some positions. This is our new staff. Uh, as in May, we have a new water utilities operator, Bailey Kleinman. And then Carlos Cladine is, is our new fleet shop tech. And then uh, all of the seasonal staff, as you see, uh, 19 seasonal staff started in May and two full-timers. So uh, as you can tell, May is a very busy month trying to get everybody going and uh, directing and uh, keeping up with uh, um, spring. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Zeroff. Yep. Any questions for Mr. Zeroff? on the monthly public works presentation. Mr. President. Commissioner Bear. I have two questions. Yes, sir. Um, are, are we responsible for, I mean, your department responsible for fogging for mosquitoes? Yes. And have we done that yet? Or yes. We have done yes, that? Yes, it has been done. Okay. Uh, they've sprayed for uh, weeds and have uh, done mosquitoes. I can't remember the exact day, but I think they started about three weeks ago or so. Uh, they've been uh, doing that. They, they fog, plus they uh, check different sites for larva and, and do all that uh, to prepare for mosquito spray. They have done that already. Okay. I, I just wanted to bring that up so the public knows that yep. it's been done. Yep. I have noticed a drop of mosquitoes in my backyard. I do appreciate that. Yep. I think it sit out and not be eaten. It is good. They do a lot of work, more than I even knew it, you know, at first. They, they uh, said go around and check uh, the, how much larvae are in different ponds, and then they spray accordingly. So I, I will forward that on that you're very appreciative of that. Yes, so. I am. They're almost like the vampires at the hospital. <laughs> That's gone there. <laughs> a little shorter needles, though. <laughs> yes. Uh, and my other, my other question is, uh, is the drop site at Broadway. Yes. How much of an issue is that becoming? Um, I think it, yeah. I I think it's in your slide there. I think did it's I, on ours in here, though. Yeah, I, I must have not have missed. I thought it was too, but I didn't see it on here. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was right there. It was right. Oh, okay. So it must have hit it. I don't know why it was hidden. Um, I think we're still getting some contamination, but not as much. Um, um, you know, I think one of the things that we just need to keep informing the public to try to yeah, because I had it here too. Um, um, I don't know why it's not on there, but I, I have on here too. Please follow signs and separate uh, so we can, you know, compost and do as much mulching as we can. Because if we can, it goes and fills our space. So I guess uh, to me, it, it, please help us compost. You know, separate your bags, separate the trees from the grass and all that, and so we can continue. I don't know how many loads we did this last month. Um, um, but uh, I know it's been considerable. Uh, they're running, uh, you know, all the time mo moving those bins around. Um, so, if, if, if this continues to be a problem for us, what is our options? Um, you know, we've talked about some other other uh, options. One of the things, especially looking at our new Baylor facility, you know, is to have a separate area that uh, people have, have that as a drop-off site and it'd be open 24-7 um, um, and having one area maybe, you know, better monitored. Um, 
but I know the, the public and even the commission would like areas throughout town, you know, so there's not just the site. I don't know what the, what the answer is okay. in, unless we do one, uh, uh, you know, controlled somebody on staff all the time yeah. watching it. I think a lot of it's education. You're going to get some people that just dump whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there's some individuals that are just, they're not going yeah. to. They're just, they, they pull up and to drive 20 more feet and throw their branches, they're just not going to do it. Um, I, I was going to suggest maybe staff could look if there's some kind of uh, boxes with screens on the top. So it would allow only grass to, if you go to hmm. dump the grass, only the grass would fall through. And then any uh, large material they'd have to then put into the tree box right because it wouldn't fall through the screens right you know um but i don't know if that's even possible if they make something like that or not so it's not a bad idea to, to look at something like that yeah. I, and i think most of it's education and we'll just keep trying to trying to do it do that a couple yeah. of engineers sitting in this room you know they probably come up with something and market it quick so but i'm sure we're not the only city that has this unique challenge um and it, it is a service I think that the public greatly appreciates, even though we have a few offenders that we just, like Mr. Zaroff said, we just have to continue to educate. And, and, and one of the things I know, even people that will, or, you know, especially on the east side of town, you know, driving out to the Baylor, one of the things that I've heard is, yeah, I'd like to drop my grass off, but I got to sit in line with all these trucks, drive around and dump it. And, and so one of our, you know, the idea with the new, expansion is that you know residents can go through this way drop it off at a z-wall and take off and not have to be with, between all the commercial trucks and and do all that so i i think doing that too will make a big difference because if it's nice and easy and friendly and they don't have to you know be between big trucks and and wait in line as as much i think that they'd be a, a lot more interested in taking it there so thank you thank you Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Off. Thank you. Move on to public safety. We have an MOU between the city of Dickinson and DSU. And this will be presented by Chief Siani. Good evening, Mr. President and Commissioners. Um, I have for your consideration to approve an MOU between the city of Dickinson Police Department and Dickinson State University regarding a limited hours campus resource officer position. This contract will establish a first of its kind part-time collegiate level campus resource officer partnership and has been in the works for over six months. Very excited that I'm finally able to bring this before you. Um, this contract also includes an educational component which would allocate 12 semester hours of college credits for each DPD officer up to 120 hours a year um, for all sworn DPD officers that which actually drops down into their family members as well. Um, we believe the college component of this contract will be very extremely beneficial for recruitment aspect and city staff recommend approval of this uh, contract. Thank you, Chief Siani. Any questions on this MOU with DSU? Hearing no questions, comments, I'd look for a motion. Mr. President, I move to approve. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Bear. Second. Second by Commissioner Sobolak. Any further comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll vote. Dr. Bear? Aye. Ms. Sobolak? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. And lastly, we have the monthly report from the police. Yes, Mr. President, I'd like to apologize for that. That should have been pulled from the agenda. I'm actually presenting the uh, year end report. Oh, the year end. Okay. And in my lieu, I'm going to have Lieutenant Hanel actually do the presentation for this. He did put uh, a lot of time and effort into this, this year-end report, and he did a fantastic job. I don't think I've seen a, a, a prettier report for many years that he's been done. So, yeah. yeah, he did a nice job. So I wanted him to be able to do the presentation for that. Wow. Everybody's stepping up their game, even uh, yes. public you know, transit. They're paying attention. So, yeah. With so. that, Lieutenant Hanel. Thank you, Chief, and good evening, President Decker and Commissioners. Uh, pleased to present to you the uh, annual report for uh, the Dickinson Police Department uh, for last year. 
Um, a little late in the year, but the, uh, the, the last uh, piece of the puzzle we were waiting on is just the statistics from FBI and the state of North Dakota just to make sure we have the numbers accurate for a report, and those just dropped here a few weeks ago. So put a bow on it here and uh, uh, head off to the races here. Uh, I, I probably won't go uh, line by line in here. Uh, obviously, this uh, is electronic uh, through the packet here this evening, and then uh, online we'll be posting it to our website and Facebook uh, for the public to view uh, at their leisure as well. Um, uh, Chief Siani had a strong vision for community partnerships that, that we've had for, for quite some time. Um, and that's, uh, you'll see through the course of this presentation, especially towards the end there, just, just how important that we cherish these uh, community partnerships with the community. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's our driving factor, what we do day in and day out, and we stress that, the importance of that to our, our uh, new hires, uh, everybody that's, that's been there for long enough, we, we see the benefits of, of having that close-knit uh, uh, community partnership and that's kind of what uh, chief alludes to here in his message uh, as far as our, our structure and uh, what we've been allotted for last uh, in 2022 we were allotted uh, 73 full-time employees um, obviously we, we weren't 100% uh, full staff there we've always been just a, a couple shy of, of being full staff uh, a big uh, bulk of that at 49 is our sworn uh, officer uh, allotment uh, 15 in dispatch four in animal control uh, three in records, and then we have an executive assistant and a, and a crime analyst uh, to round out the, the 73. In terms of the budget, uh, we are allocated uh, $7.1 million for uh, the, the budget in 2022. The, the big slice of the pie there is obviously the salaries and the benefits, um, yeah, which encumber uh, quite, quite a bit uh, of, of that share. Only 4% uh, uh, it goes towards our services for, for telephone technology, our general su supplies such as gasoline, our SWAT uh, team uh, all allocation, that, that's roughly at 3%, and any capital betterment such as our new squad cars that we, that we put in rotation, that's, that's only 6%. So when you re really look at that, you know, the, the 64 and the 23% for salary and benefits, it, it's, it's, it's um, somewhat staggering, but then it's, it's also, we look at that as, as an investment, and we've been very uh, appreciative for the support that the Commission's given us over the years to um, uh, really offer a tremendous benefits package citywide that we've been uh, able to attract um, several uh, high quality candidates for for our open positions and that's uh, that's that's what's been very attractive so we do appreciate your support uh, ongoing support uh, in, in those uh, fields as far as our call volume for uh, in 2022 we are sitting at uh, 26,946 calls for service which is approximately 1.3 percent up from uh, 2021 uh, again, just as a recap, call for service is any type of call generated um, either by uh, a citizen calling into dispatch, and that also includes self-initiated activity that our officers perform. Um, so the top of those uh, calls for service, uh, self-initiated uh, traffic stops up at uh, uh, 4680, and it kind of goes down from there. Um, welfare checks, or, uh, speak with an officers and welfare checks uh, are top topping the list for citizen call-in. Um, actually, I guess animal-related calls as well. Uh, those uh, usually on a daily basis, we see quite a quite a few of those. Uh, our traffic stops are down 15% from 2020, uh, 2021. Um, uh, likely, and uh, uh, reasoning behind that is just the, the amount of field training we uh, were conducting uh, last year. Uh, so more time of, of the cars being paired up, uh, doubled with the FTO and and, and uh, the trainee. So there's not uh, that additional officer on the street to be able to do self-initiated uh, activities like traffic stops. Uh, and, and then the chart at the bottom there is just kind of a year-over-year. Year. Uh, we're certainly down uh, from a call for service from our uh, all-time highs in 20, uh, uh, 2018 and 2019, but still uh, incrementally increasing uh, since then. For cr uh, crash data, uh, 815 total crashes that we responded to. 33 of those were injury, 12 pedestrian. And unfortunately, we did have one fatality uh, last year. That was a uh, uh, two-vehicle collision up at the intersection of uh, State Avenue and, uh, I believe, Coke Street. That, that's a, a pretty treacherous intersection up there, right uh, kind of where county meets city. And unfortunately, there was a fatality off of that. Uh, the, the month, um, month monthly totals uh, towards the winter, it was actually a pretty uh, treacherous winter last year. So that likely attributed to uh, our spike in uh, crashes towards the end of the year there. Uh, moving over to uh, the patrol section itself, um, traffic enforcement, uh, our parking uh, enforcement for uh, 2022 was almost doubled, uh, uh, it was actually more um, 
in the 2020 and 2021 combined. So we were very active in uh, issuing a, a parking enforcement. Um, everything else is kind of uh, right on par with everything else. Um, our top citations that we've been issuing continue to be speeding violations, uh, followed uh, by driving without liability insurance and failure to register motor vehicles as our top three. And then a highlight there is uh, Senior Patrol Officer LaShawn Pickstock uh, returned in December of last year after spending about one, years, uh, me, one year on the uh, border uh, of uh, the United States in uh, support of the North Dakota uh, Army National Guard deployment that uh, they had down there. So it was good to have him back uh, here uh, first part of the year. Uh, now into the crime statistics, which I think uh, what a lot of people are uh, most curious about when it comes time uh, for the law enforcement uh, year-end report. Uh, the first chart up there is just our year-over-year uh, -year comparisons of the three sections that, that I'll, I'll get into in here in just a second uh, individually. But property, person, and uh, crimes against property, crimes against a person, and crimes against society. Uh, each in different colors. The, the overall trend, as you can see there, is we've been trending downward, which is, is um, very, very good news, um, especially uh, uh, crimes against uh, property have, have started to finally take a dip from the highs back uh, in, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, the bottom chart there is just a breakout of uh, the year over year for uh, person crimes. Um, I, I realized my legend there kind of got a little... Uh, uh, off uh, kilter there, but uh, as, as far as like hom uh, homicides, for instance, we haven't uh, had one in the city of Dickinson, not going for 2020, um, and everything else has been uh, uh, appreciatively de in decline as far as e even the simple assaults for that matter uh, show a steady decline year over year. Um, the, uh, the note I have on the bottom there is person crimes have decreased 11% from their highs in 2019. Um, Aggravated assaults, however, do continue to trend high. Aggravated assaults are a little bit more serious in nature, broken bones, knock, uh, lost consciousness, uh, those, those sort of crimes. Uh, switching over to uh, crimes against society, um, again, a, a, a precipitous uh, um, trend going downwards. Uh, drug offenses and uh, disorderly conducts, um, kind of our, our main share of uh, crimes against society. And those uh, numbers uh, compared from 2018 and, and down. And then last on the bottom there is the, the property crimes. Um, the thefts, again, are, are continuing to decrease, which is, which is very good from the, uh, the height uh, of uh, 2018 to 2019. Uh, any questions with the statistics before we move on to the other portions there? Okay. Uh, training, um, we're, we're very proud of the training program that we have at the, at the police department. It uh, uh, continues to get better every year. We have a lot of uh, uh, good ideas floating around out there and, and uh, attaching ourselves to some contemporary um, ideas of how to train and, and, and things that around the nation uh, that are best practices and trying to get our officers involved with those. Um, we've been operating under a concept of quarterly trainings for quite some time now. So each quarter, the entire uh, uh, sworn staff attends a quarterly training on, on their day off, and uh, we break it up um, into different uh, types of subjects. The first one in, uh, uh, in quarter one was an active assailant, and that's uh, the, the picture in the lower left there. That's uh, Officer Kubik there uh, in, in Dickens Middle School. We we're uh, training on active assailant uh, in that particular quarter. Um, you know, and specifically on that one, I got to take my police hat off and put my parent hat on. Uh, I, I was there uh, just uh, participating in kind of a... Uh, uh, we record all the scenarios and give feedback to that. Every one of those officers that performed the training uh, that particular quarter uh, performed uh, extremely skillfully and, and competently. And, and for a parent to know that, uh, that the level of training and competency that our officers are exhibiting, especially in, in a topic like that, that's uh, probably near and dear to a lot of parents' hearts, uh, knowing that our uh, department is trained to that level to, to uh, stop a threat like that is, is very comforting. Um, and, and, I, and I hope the public... Uh, really takes heart to that as well, as, as much as I do. Um, in quarter two, uh, EVOC, which is our emergency vehicle operations course, probably one of the most fun, get to drive fast and knock over cones. Uh, quarter three was another use of force, um, both in, in uh, written or theory and then application. Uh, and then the quarter four was a taser um, and then in our combatives type of thing, which is the lower right picture or a, a put on a big suit and, and be the bad guy and get beat up a little bit. That was pretty fun. In total, uh, 3,796 uh, post hours for our sworn staff. 857 uh, of that is uh, not uh, certified, but we still track it. And then 183 
uh, hours of training was completed by our non-sworn staff, so like our uh, records, our dispatchers. Uh, so we, we, again, we put a high emphasis on training to, to have uh, our uh, officers and all of our employees uh, uh, top-notch and, and uh, ready at a moment's notice. For our Southwest Tactical Team, um, we continue to have a, uh, a decline of the number of callouts that we have per year, which uh, still uh, necessitates us in, in maintaining a level of uh, proficiency and, and, and skill. So they continue to, to train as if the, the call is going to come you know, right, right away. Um, so they uh, continue to train uh, uh, two times a month for eight hours. Um, but as far as the callouts they had this year, the, the only uh, large one they had was an armed barricaded subject um, right, uh, uh, right, right around uh, Halloween. It was, um, actually, I think I have that mixed up. The, the, the May 5th, uh, the May 20th one, there we go, was a barricaded uh, suspect that actually have a, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about, we actually introduced the, uh, the canine unit uh, in, in that situation to resolve that. But uh, our, our team is uh, now encompassing uh, more deputies from the Dunn County Sheriff's Department this year. Uh, more from the Stark County Sheriff's Office, and then we also have uh, deputies from the Hedinger County Sheriff's Office that serve on our crisis negotiation team. So it truly is a, a regional team and a team effort, and uh, yeah, they get the job done. In November, we had the Farm Credit Services award the team a rural community grant, and those funds were used to purchase uh, uh, breaching equipment uh, that, that both the team and, and patrol used to get uh, into structure uh, on a moment's notice if they need to. Our canine unit uh, still comprised of uh, Senior Officer uh, Troy Mahusky with K9 Norman, a uh, single purpose black lab, and uh, Corporal Jaden Peters with uh, K9 Kahlo, who is a dual purpose, so does the narcotics work along with patrol work. Uh, in total, their efforts uh, resulted in uh, 22 arrests for drug related offenses. Uh, they completed 144 K9 sniffs in total. As far as the, uh, the, the types of drugs that they found, uh, six of those being methamphetamine, uh, two cocaine, four fentanyl. Um, I think there were some, some other oddball ones they had in there, and then 18 drug paraphernalia um, arrests off of that. Uh, Corporal Peters and K-9 Kahlo had a total of 29 patrol deployments, so that would be uh, tracking a suspect uh, using, using the odor uh, of, of a suspect, um, diff different stuff like that. And then the, the main one, like I was referring to in the, in the prior slide with the SWAT team, that's actually the lower right picture there, that was a uh, suspect that was brandishing a knife in an apartment complex, uh, uh, threatening neighbors, and then ultimately barricaded himself in his apartment building. Uh, the team tried as best they could. We had CNT in, in the hallway, tried to uh, negotiate a peaceful sur surrender for, them, for, for himself, um, but he refused to do so. Ultimately, the SWAT team breached the door, um, and with the uh, a combination of uh, less lethal munitions and uh, canine Kahlo, were, were, they were able to take him into custody. Uh, without uh, any further incident, and he only sustained minor injuries. So it was the first uh, uh, deployment for um, uh, K-9 Kahlo, a successful deployment that, that uh, uh, highlights the, uh, the, the great benefit uh, of, of, of having him as, as a resource for patrol and SWAT. Uh, going on to our Criminal Investigations Division, they investigated uh, 730 cases last year, 96 call-outs with uh, 52 search warrants drafted, uh, they conducted eight polygraph examinations, and the, uh, one of the biggest things that they've uh, really uh, come to the forefront as of recent is more of our digital forensics, uh, downloading phones um, uh, through the, uh, the, the gray key uh, uh, software that we have now that uh, uh, Detective Sergeant Lines was able to procure from, uh, from that company. Uh, we're, we're able to get into more phones that, that we haven't been able to in, in the past, so they stay uh, quite busy. Um, uh, in, in uh, unlocking phones. We have some notable cases down there. I, I won't uh, go through each individual one, but uh, it certainly was a, uh, um, somewhat of a busy year, probably not as busier as, as some, but uh, right out of the gate was the uh, New Year's Eve shooting that we had at, uh, uh, at the uh, Paragon Bowling Alley area. Uh, a stray bullet was actually, uh, during, during that this situation, a stray bullet was fired from the parking lot and ended up going across the street, across the lard and lodging itself into the to the walls of the lobby at the Oasis Inn. Ultimately, uh, four uh, people were arrested off of that, and one was just recently sent, uh, sentenced to prison for uh, those, uh, those actions. Uh, another highlight I just want to highlight briefly while under the Criminal Investigations Division is our Badlands Crime Stoppers program. It uh, continues to uh, gain more traction, more tips every year. Um, 
It allows uh, citizens to take an active part in crime fighting by submitting anonymous tips, and they have, it has led to the identification and arrest of suspects. Uh, in, uh, in particular, in 2022, we've uh, had uh, 215 leads that were received by the program, and a payment of $500 was actually issued to a tipster that was able to provide some information in reference to uh, a recovery of a stolen UTV. So that, that was a, that's, that's a great program, both uh, either uh, on the app or dial into the phone number or on our website as well. Uh, going to the Narcotics Task Force, another uh, big component where I get asked about quite a bit of what, what, what the drug uh, scene is in town. Um, it continues to be fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl, fentanyl, the, the M30 pills, that's, that's what we're seeing. Yeah, it's it's uh, very unfortunate that that's still uh, gets uh, any community across the nation right now struggling with it, and uh, we're obviously not an exception to that. Uh, the Southwest Narcotics Task Force is um, a partnership that we do with the North Dakota uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigations. We do, in 2022, we had uh, one officer assigned to the task force. Uh, this year, uh, we uh, were finally able to get this, our second um, officer that we've been planning to put in that position for quite a while. They are now serving um, in that capacity. Uh, their office reported a, uh, a slight dropping in the number of cases uh, that, that were going out, although they have uh, several pending uh, federal um, indictments pe uh, pending on, on several federal charges. Um, one thing that came up that they have the picture of down there uh, back in October was the appearance, the first appearance in Dickinson of rainbow fentanyl. So this is the uh, those uh, uh, pills uh, that, that contain fentanyl in it that were that are, have been identified by the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, to having been manufactured by the cartel south of the border to look like that to entice uh, younger, um, younger people to, to want to get addicted to their product. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a business for them. And uh, unfortunately, we, we started seeing a uh, resurgence of that in the area. Um, and, and another side note there at the bottom there, we still have our overdose prevention and uh, recognition uh, YouTube video. If, if you'd want to look at that, there's a QR code to scan there. Um, it's really important, uh, probably more than ever, that uh, people uh, recognize the signs and symptoms of a over potential overdose and, and what we can do to prevent that. And, and that's uh, through the administration of, of Narcan or Naloxone. Um, the one thing that we don't have the, the greatest ability to do uh, right now is the ability to track the number of, of overdoses that, that we're having within the community. Um, if both from, from, there's so many different sources of that number, and that number is probably never really all that terribly accurate. Uh, for us, it's, it's not a crime to overdose, so it's nothing that we track in our system per se for, for FBI statistic purposes. Uh, so it's, it's basically, um, as, as best we can, documenting that in a report style. So uh, before I came, I just typed in the word overdose, and, and there were about 70 instances last year um, where our officers uh, drafted a report uh, with some mention of overdose and, and just kind of going through there at least, yeah, between 60 to 70 instances where our officers responded and administered Narcan or had some other uh, sort of information about an overdose occurring. Um, but then couple that in with any that present at the hospital um, that we don't have access to because of HIPAA, and obviously th that number is is uh, quite scary, and and obviously an, an issue that every community around the nation right now is is uh, uh, trying to fight. Uh, going into the uh, school resource officer tab, uh, we uh, in 2022 had uh, three SROs in the schools. We now have a fourth. Um, and then with the, with the DSU uh, agreement that you just uh, approved here just a little bit ago, uh, our school resource program has, has been the strongest it's ever been. Um, some of the highlights there, the, their text-to-tip program, which was developed a few years back, uh, which uh, they have a phone number uh, posted in, inside the schools for uh, students to be able to text or directly to anonymously text uh, to our uh, school resource officers and uh, provide them tips uh, of what's going on, you know, bullying or dr uh, drugs or any other type of, of uh, uh, illegal uh, behavior or even just uh, needing to, to talk to them. Uh, they received 132 of those such tips uh, la uh, during the last school year. Uh, our Criminal Justice Academy class set that we partner with the high school with uh, keeps continuing to grow off of that and we have 24 students that graduated out of that uh, this year. They provided 114 uh, adopt-a-cop stops at, at the patrol level through uh, at, the, at the elementary schools. Uh, our SROs also uh, uh, host ALICE training, which is uh, 
basically an uh, anti-active uh, shooter or active threat uh, training uh, for uh, businesses and also for, for uh, district employees for, for the school system as well. And then our, uh, our flagship program within the schools is, is our D.A.R.E. program in the fifth and seventh grade. And we've uh, uh, they, they graduated two of those classes here this year. As far as uh, what we're seeing trend-wise, um, for the most part, uh, trending downwards a, a little bit. The one spike there is, is the tobacco at uh, DHS last year. A lot of, vape, a lot of vaping issues is, is continually what we're seeing uh, at the school level. Uh, vaping just seems to continue to be getting out of hand with our youth. Um, switching over to our dispatch center, uh, uh, fairly consistent call volumes from one year to the, to the next. Uh, 10,197 911 calls were made to our PSAP center last year. Uh, we did receive 65 texts to 911 calls. I think uh, just another PSA on that, that if uh, you're not in a position to be able to dial 911, you're able to text it to, uh, to our P uh, PSAP center. Now we have the capabilities to be able to initiate conversations through, through texting. Uh, we also implemented a uh, software called uh, Intellicom with a company called APCO. Uh, this will allow our dispatchers to um, ask, uh, ensure that they're asking the correct questions on certain calls, uh, be it a medical call or a robbery in, in progress. Uh, the, the, uh, they have guide cards that, that ensure that they're asking the correct questions and we're uh, getting that information out to the right resources. So that, uh, that software was uh, implemented last year. Uh, going on to our records uh, management uh, area of the department, uh, they remained uh, quite busy with the, besides collating and uh, uh, filing all of our uh, reports to NIBRS, which is the Federal Repository for our Statistics. They also provide the fingerprint services, which uh, were up in 2022. And they also, um, I should probably maybe uh, adjusted this slide or this uh, graph here a little bit. They had uh, uh, just a little over 250 sex offenders that came in and either register for the initial, their, their initial requirements uh, when they enter the city, or if there was a change of employment or, some, or change of a vehicle, uh, that's what that, uh, that number is, is. We went on 250 uh, registered sex offenders in, in Dickinson. This just represents the, the amount of times that they've uh, made either an initial change or, or a change on their um, uh, initial registration. Uh, going to animal control. Um, our staff out there is doing a really good job. We're, we're uh, full staffed out there right now. Um, and we, uh, we are up in both our uh, dog and cat impounds and um, obviously our uh, adoption rates are uh, right on par with either returning to owner or adoption. Very, very few um, uh, we've had to euthanize in, in the past. And if, if it was a euthanization, uh, it was either uh, medically related is, is what we've uh, had to do there. Um, also last year we, we had our animal control officers begin the process of becoming uh, certified animal control officers uh, through a national organization called the National Animal Care and uh, Control Association. So uh, part of that is just some online uh, learning that they uh, complete and uh, throughout the course of the year they have to have continuing ed uh, requirements that uh, just allow them to um, really dive deep into the, into the world of animal control and, and how to uh, investigate uh, cases of abuse and neglect and, and those sorts of things. So we have a really uh, talented staff out there right now that's uh, getting some pretty good training uh, in that aspect. Uh, getting to the home stretch here, just some highlights of uh, some of the things that we uh, did within the community. Uh, last year, again, our Heroes Ball, Guns and Hoses, National Night Out, a couple pictures there. Uh, we did an homage slide to uh, Snowmageddon <laughs> last year that, uh, that we had. Um, uh, of course, our Bearcat getting buried there, and, and Corporal Peters obviously enjoying himself out there, uh, digging, digging out. I don't know if I'd have been in the same position, but uh, just to highlight our off-the-cuff podcast, um, myself and uh, Lieutenant Clouser um, are continuing to host that. That, that continues to get uh, uh, quite a few clicks on there, and, and uh, Lieutenant Clouser does an amazing job. He's got that... Uh, uh, Joe Rogan, Jocko Wilnick, kind of kind of persona to him. He's really good at uh, getting conversation going, and we get a lot of positive feedback from the community members. Um, and we had uh, about seven or eight uh, episodes that we uh, completed last year. And to uh, either listen to that or, or to watch uh, off the cuff, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, you can anywhere you get uh, 
podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, and we also have a video version that's on YouTube and uh, Facebook as well. Uh, some awards and milestones. Uh, we uh, awarded our Intel analyst, uh, Janelle Grohl, with the uh, 2022 Chiefs Award of Excellence. So uh, she's, she's done a tremendous job with um, our uh, crime uh, analysis uh, program within CIU. Uh, she's been very pivotal, pivotal in uh, uh, assisting officers and detectives in getting information that they need in order to uh, identify a suspect or, or clear clay, uh, case or, or something like that. So she's done a tremendous job. We also had uh, two promotions. Uh, Senior Officer uh, Sam Oki was uh, promoted to uh, Detective Corporal, and uh, Senior Officer Corey Wallace was promoted to uh, Corporal on, on her shift. And then, of course, we have to mention uh, uh, Police Chaplain Jim Hessler, who's been with our uh, department as a police chaplain uh, for many, many, many years, uh, finally decided to uh, call it retirement, and so we uh, are very grateful for, for the many years of service and, and uh, um, camaraderie that we've had with him, uh, being there with us uh, during a very difficult time, so we, we appreciate his service and his sacrifice that he's done uh, for our department. Uh, and then last uh, here, just, just to mention sake, last year also we, we did lose a former officer, uh, Lieutenant Darrell Haig, uh, back in December. Uh, he, he passed away in Missoula at uh, 74 years old. Um, he was uh, very pivotal, pivotal uh, in, in trans, uh, trans, transforming uh, the department uh, in the early 80s. We really brought on some uh, um, uh, new ideas um, and brought the department that, that stepped closer to modern policing. So he was a very, uh, played a very pivotal role in that. So um, with that, I, I appreciate uh, all you do for, for the department, your, the support you give us. And, uh, uh, and with that, I'd uh, stand for any questions if you do have any. Thank you, Lieutenant Hanel. Uh, any questions on the yearly report from the police department? I have a right. question and just comment. You guys do a great job. Um, I, I hear nothing but positive things about our, our police department and our other emergency services, so keep up the good work. Um, you guys um, do a lot for this community, and I, I just want to let you know that a lot of people appreciate it. So. Yeah. And we appreciate oh, thank the support. You. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving right along, we have taken care of the resolution in the community development for the Sundance Cove. So we'll move into its commission. It's your time. Is there anything not on the agenda this evening that you wish to bring up? Not. I'd look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We are adjourned.